The container was due to be placed under a precarious dead tree sitting in a hedge which you can see in this first picture, uh, so that was taken down. However, as you'll see later on in the video, a chunk of the wood cut down is now built into the studio as a feature. Next it was just a case of clearing the wood so that we could begin work. Four concrete foundations were dug out for the corners of the container, leaving the majority of the container floating a few inches above the ground. The foundations were covered in a thick rubber matting to minimise any vibrations of vehicles driving in or out of the car park reverberating the studio. The 20-foot high cube container arrived and was winched into place in a matter of minutes. The high cube container is a normal dimension of a container, but with an extra foot and a half of headroom. With the container placed, a trench was dug to pass the armoured electricity cable out to the house before laying a temporary flat work surface outside to work on during the build. Then it was simply a case of ordering the first wave of materials ready for work to commence. You can see the masking tape on the floor where we planned out the rough shape of the control and live room. I was extremely lucky to have the help and expertise of Nick Watson from Hatstand Design to help me with the build. Nick's skills as a bespoke cabinet maker were largely underused during the early stages of the project, but his attention to detail meant that throughout the project everything fitted perfectly and we were always five steps ahead of ourselves. The first job was to add a layer of TechSound SY50 adhesive membrane to the walls and ceiling. The TechSound was not only added to reduce airborne and impact noise, but to increase the thickness of the walls. Difference in temperature inside and outside containers can result in condensation being created. Container suppliers do offer a spray that goes on the ceiling of the container to achieve the same effect, but this method helped both acoustic and condensation issues. Adhesing the tech sound to the ceiling was a particular feat due to each roll weighing around 40 kilograms. The whole build used 10 of these rolls. After painstakingly moulding the tech sound into all the ridges of the container, it was time to lay the floor. This is a product called Sound Deck, which is essentially chipboard with an acoustic foam on the bottom. Next, the stud walls and ceiling were ready to be fitted for the rock wall to sit in after the first electric fix. The electrician routed for a fuse box, three double sockets and two lights in the control room, and five lights with three double sockets in the live room and laid the armour cable. The extra headroom in the container allowed us to pass half the ventilation discreetly in the ceiling. Next in was the rock wall. I used RW3 rock wall over RWA45 rock wall due to its extra density. I had planned on also installing a floating bar system for the plywood walls to fix onto, but the cost and time involved was just too high uh, against the potential benefits. So the plywood fixed straight to the stud walls, and the end result has worked perfectly without the bars anyway.
With the walls and ceiling covered, the partition wall and the outer wall were ready to be assembled and fitted. These are double thickness of the already installed walls, each consisting of two stud frames with rock wool, separated by a layer of tech sand and then finished with a layer of plywood. With the shape of the studio up, I started the laborious task of polyfilling and sanding the joins and screw heads to prepare the space for paint. Luckily, I have some wonderful friends who gave up their time to help. Next was building the feature wall at the back of the live room. This is made completely from the tree cut down at the start of the build. The wood was chainsawed into discs and then taken to Nick's workshop where I spent a few days sawing it down into short pieces three centimetres tall and a variety of thicknesses. As the wood was freshly cut, once it was sawn into lengths it warped to create these beautiful curves. These pieces were then nail gunned to the back wall of the studio with the chainsaw edge facing out to create one huge skyline diffuser. Generally a room as small as this has no need for such a big diffuser, however I was aware that we had made a completely parallel box um, and hoped that that would help break up the reflections inevitably bouncing from wall to wall and it just looks fantastic. The front wall that was exposed to the elements was coated with Tyvek waterproof membrane and then wood cladded. While I was cladding the front wall, Nick was building me a window casing to hold the two 38mm thick double glazed window panes that I had custom ordered and would provide a view through the partition wall. The live room side pane is set at a slight downward angle to help direct sound hitting the window in a different direction to its source. 10 litres of paint now cover the plywood, white ceilings with red walls. I was again very lucky to have friends and family eager to help. When applying the tech sound at the start of the project, we deliberately covered all 10 air vents in the container that are built in so that I could control all the air coming in and out myself. After a significant amount of research and multiple redesigns of the ventilation system, I decided to have an active output powered by a vent axia house extractor. 
This meant I was able to have a passive input system because the slight pressure difference created by the active in draws fresh air in through the input vents. This is only designed to be a trickle and when putting your hand in front of the input vents you can feel fresh air gently being drawn in. Both vent systems run out of the floor of the container and out behind, where the input runs through a small acoustic maze chamber created to eliminate any outdoor sounds passing into the room through the vents. The ventilation is set to automatically start when the fuse box is turned on upon entering the studio. With this installed, the visible ventilation could be boxed off and the electrician was ready to come and complete the second fix. Eager to get the live room finished so I could start playing, I pushed on with the floor. This involved the very last of the tech sound, a layer of underlay and a wood effect laminate flooring. Attempting to make the space feel as big as possible, I decided to make my absorbers from floor to ceiling, which instantly made the room feel taller. The wood holding the absorbers is 100mm wide and 75mm rock wall slabs fill them. This creates a 25mm air gap between the wall and the wall to further their effectiveness. The absorbers are screwed onto the wall with two mil washers to ensure they are not in contact. On the left side, you can see the absorbers do not go from floor to ceiling. The block along the wall underneath them is a passive input vent, which doubles as a shelf for mics and other accessories. With the rock wall wrapped in fabric and the floor beading installed, the live room was almost complete. Finally, the installation of the control room desk, windowsill and live room shelf. The oak was picked out by Nick and includes this beautiful wainy edge desk. With the addition of some extra ceiling sound treatment and little features, the build was complete. With the rock wall wrapped in fabric, oh, it's really hard to say. With the rock, with the rock wall, with the rock wall, with the rock wall wrapped, with the rock wall wrapped.